let me just talk a little bit about what I'm going to do. It's, it's, it's a little bit difficult. Coming up with criticisms of the papers that were sent to me, uh, I figured that I wouldn't do any better than the questioners, and why repeat that? So instead, what I'm going to do today is provide a framework for thinking about today's talks and some of the other talks that we've heard um, that might raise questions or might be objectionable. Uh, and so that's what I figured I would do. Um, hopefully, hopefully, people will see the connections. Um, so I want to start with uh, what, for me, is sort of an interesting question. And that is, philosophers and psychologists study rationality. We have philosophers and psychologists just here in the audience. We're supposed to all be talking about rationality. So why don't we talk to each other more if we're allegedly studying the same thing? Uh, and I have a simple thesis, and, uh, and this is way too crude, but uh, roughly it goes like this. For 50 years, philosophers have been focused on epistemological categories that apply to belief tokens, to individual beliefs. Uh, and if you paid attention to uh, the, most of the philosophy talks in our, uh, in our meeting, um, Oops, sorry. Well, psychologists focus primarily on reasoning, on describing and sometimes evaluating how we reason. So the philosophers here in Barcelona, most of the talks, not all of them, uh, have focused on the question when thinking about rationality, is it rational for a particular person to believe a proposition? That's been uh, uh, the, the main issue that philosophers have been talking about. Uh, and, and three quarters of today, see, I'm, I'm trying to be a responsible commentator. Three quarters of the talks today referred to Thomas, I call it the Game of Thrones argument, um, that uh, I can have re overwhelming epistemic reasons to believe something, even though I have no instrumental or pragmatic reasons to believe this. Uh, you've heard the argument. Uh, I, I don't know how Game of Thrones ends. Somebody reliable tells me. Uh, I now ha don't have any uh, instrumental or pragmatic reasons to believe how Game of Thrones ends, um, but I do have overwhelming epistemic reasons to believe it. The psychologists in Barcelona, on the, on the other hand, have talked about, uh, and the ones in yellow are because I've talked to the psychologists about those two, uh, so, uh, but take the best, the recognition heuristic, Bayesian reasoning and frequency formats, the representativeness heuristic, the, the, I've talked to people about the peak end rule, planning fallacy. Um, so, so what's the right focus? What, you know, should we focus on beliefs or should we focus on reasoning? Should we do both? Um, and I want to suggest there's two different approaches to epistemology that we've seen here. And there's probably more, uh, but here's just two. And one, uh, one when, you're, when you're evaluating, you might want to be a judge. So the purpose of evaluation, evaluative judgments, is to assign responsibility, uh, praise and blame. Uh, the judges' evaluations are connected to uh, the reactive attitudes, shame, pride, resentment, anger. So that's one possible approach you might take to, uh, to uh, normative matters and to epistemological matters. Or, and I was going to use Donald Trump there, but I thought it would be a little too aggressive. Um, uh, or you might be a coach, right? You might, where the purpose of evaluations is, uh, is amelioration, is to improve performance. Uh, now, of course, there is a judgment implicit in the coach's advice. Namely, that your performance is in some ways faulty. But ultimately, the purpose of the evaluation uh, is to offer advice that, that improves performance. Now, if I were interested in being an epistemological judge, I would probably be an internalist. Now, as some of you know, I, I'm not an internalist. Uh, uh, internalism is roughly the view that the epistemic status of a belief is entirely a function of states that are immediately accessible to the believer. Okay, now I don't defend this, this view, uh, or you might just say the justificatory status of a belief. Uh, um, I don't subscribe to this view, but if I were a judge, uh, if I were interested in making uh, 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 evaluative judgments like a judge does, then intuitively it seems like a mistake to hold people responsible for things that are totally outside their ken. But I actually uh, am not, don't view myself as an epistemological judge. Um, now there are times definitely for being an, a, a judge. Um, 
I, I, I think, you know, for, for in my case, and here I'm just speaking autobiographically, uh, usually or maybe always when bad reasoning has or potentially has bad consequences. So somebody who believes that Obama was born in Kenya or that climate change isn't real, I'm happy to be a judge when it comes to uh, uh, evaluating those uh, beliefs. But there's something wrong, if you, think about, uh, if you think about it, I think, there's something wrong with a person who is only ever a judge. I think most of us don't want to be that sort of person. Uh, we don't want such a person as a parent, a friend, a partner, a colleague. We don't want somebody who, who is constantly wagging a finger and never lending a hand. Uh, so do we really want an epistemology that's only for judges? And if not, what would an epistemology for somebody who is interested in being a coach, what would it look like? So, let's focus on epistemology for a coach. If, you, if, you're, if you're interested in making evaluative judgments from the perspective of a coach, how would you do it? Well, a good coach focuses on factors that a player has a dr some direct control over, right? So if you, if you tell a player, oh, get out there and hit a home run, you, that's a lousy coach, right? Or go out, just go, score a goal, right? That's, that's a lousy coach. Instead, what you do is, you know, you, you, you give them advice about things that they have some direct control over. So uh, a child who's having trouble hitting, you might tell them to start their stride sooner. Or somebody who keeps shooting the ball over the goal, you might tell them to keep your head down when you shoot. Uh, so direct control, when it comes to epistemology, we, we have some direct, at least some direct control over how we reason to our beliefs, what uh, David called our doxastic dispositions, but we have very little, if any, direct control over our beliefs. So a coach is going to do what psychologists have been doing in this, uh, in here, and in general, and that is uh, focusing on our belief acquisition strategies or our reasoning broadly construed, not on our individual beliefs, which we have. Focusing, if you're a coach, to focus on individual beliefs is sort of like telling somebody, telling a child, just go hit a home run. Second, a good coach, I think, is an externalist uh, about their advice. So, look, a good coach uses all the resources at her disposal to give useful advice, including resources not immediately available to the player. So, look, uh, a good coach advises, advises a player to start her stride sooner or keep her head down when she shoots, even if that player has no immediate access to that information. So again, if you, if you are doing epistemology from the perspective of a coach, uh, you would focus on reasoning and you would be an externalist, I think, if you want to be a good coach. Now, of course, obviously, a good coach uh, that is going to give advice that takes into account the player's resources and abilities. So uh, when, I, when I coach soccer, uh, I tell my kids just, you know, aim for about a yard inside the, the goalpost and shoot it low and hard, right? If you're a little more advanced, there are tricks you can do to try and trick the, the goalkeeper to, go, to think the ball is going one way when actually the ball is going the other way. Throwing a curveball again, a uh, child that's too young. Uh, might not show uh, him or her how to throw a curveball, a little older you might. But good advice might ignore the player's own views about her resources and abilities, even if those views from her perspective are perfectly justified. Uh, you might think that this player is capable of doing more than she thinks uh, she is, or you might think that she's uh, overly optimistic about what she's capable of. So. There's two dominant consequentialist theories. Uh, uh, I'm just going to, let's just look at them. Reliabilism, you're going to evaluate reasoning strategies in terms of their accuracy. So if you're going to be a coach, you could try and evaluate how we reason in terms of the accuracy of that reasoning. The pragmatist, and I take Steve Stitch to be defending uh, a view something like this, uh, says you should evaluate reasoning strategies in terms of the quality of their instrumental results, roughly. So, if you take pragmatism to be this sort of view, or instrumentalism to be this sort of view, then, then again, I'm trying to be somewhat responsible and talk about the uh, argument that people talked about. The pragmatists can argue the reasoning strategies that lead one to believe that P in the Game of Thrones example are all things considered pr pragmatically best. Uh, 
So a good coach, whether a pragmatist or a reliabilist, is going to offer different advice depending on a reasoner's skills and abilities. I've already sort of touched on this point. So you can think of this as a knob that goes to 11. Oh, does that, did not, that not come out? So this, this, this one goes to 11. Uh, and um, so at 11, you might have an ideal agent, right? And so uh, if you're a reliabilist, you might, offer, you might say, for, well, for an ideal agent, you know, the, the ideal agent should maybe be a Bayesian. Uh, but it's probably unlike the advice you're going to give to normal folk. Uh, the pragmatist, I don't, I'm not sure what the pragmatist would say. Maybe the pragmatist would say Bayesian, but I don't know that, the, that we know enough about what ideal agents are like for the pragmatist to be offering much good advice there. So here's a nine, going down a couple. Uh, to have a person with a supercomputer computer, uh, solving a well-defined problem with lots of data, uh, here, I think the reli reliableist and the pragmatist is going to suggest maybe a fancy prediction model or maybe a not so fancy prediction model. Um, that's good. Seven, let's say, is a normal human. Now, the reliableist is going to embrace pragmatic considerations for. Now, remember, when, when the knob was turned up to 11, the reliableist wasn't, wasn't introducing any pragmatic considerations. But now that you're talking about a normal human, uh, I think the reliableist, there's, there's three different places where pragmatic considerations are going to play a role. One is on what, and, and various people have touched on this over the course of the last three days, uh, so one is just what problems are you going to focus on? So a person with limited resources should attend to significant problems, uh, not uh, trivial problems. Um, and again, if you're interested in an ideal agent, you don't need this pragmatic consideration uh, if you're going to be a coach. But if, you know, if you're going to be a good coach and you're talking about normal people, uh, that's one, one uh, thing you're going to want to do. Second, avoiding high cost errors. Um, so I'm not sure that I really want to avoid errors. Uh, there's, there's some well-known problems where we're willing to accept more error but low cost error in exchange for fewer high-cost errors, okay? Uh, so famous case is predator, predator detection, right? So we're willing to have a predator detector that, um, that uh, gives us false alarms but doesn't leave us exposed when the tiger shows up. Um, medical diagnosis uh, is another place where, uh, where that's going to be relevant. Third, uh, there will be accuracy effort uh, trade-offs. Uh, so compared to, uh, and I hear um, uh, an ideal strategy, those are, that's in scare quotes, uh, uh, but compared to an ideal strategy, sometimes the reliabilist is going to recommend a reasoning strategy that is a bit less reliable, but much cheaper, right? Um, uh, whereas you wouldn't necessarily do that for the ideal agent. Uh, maybe a strategy that's about as reliable as the ideal strategy, and uh, Gigerenza has some, some cases in which he argues that uh, um, you, you can have a more, and other psychologists have argued this too, that, you, that sometimes uh, a, a non-ideal reasoning strategy can be even more reliable than an ideal strategy. Um, uh, those sorts of examples are what, ultimately, what sort of pulled me into epistemology to begin with. Um, okay, so I think that, that the reliableist is going to say, look, good reasoning involves uh, reliable reasoning, accurate reasoning, uh, but, you're gonna, but when it comes to, but when the knob is not all the way to 11, when it's down at 7 for us normal folks, uh, we're going to need some pragmatic, uh, 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 some pragmatic factors. Now, uh, a reliableist of this sort can expect a two-pronged attack. So from reliableists on the one side and, uh, and from uh, pragmatists on the other. So uh, the reliableists would say, well, look, get rid of all that pragmatic stuff, right? Why, do you have, why are you cut? And so Ram Nada actually uh, accused uh, J.D. Trout and I of embracing a mongrel epistemology that, uh, that embraces both pragmatic and, reli and accuracy considerations. Uh, uh, and that I should just get rid of the pragmatic stuff. Uh, and from my perspective, look, if you're going to be a coach and you're going to, uh, and you're not dealing with somebody who's at an 11, uh, there's good reason for embracing a mongrel epistemology. The pragmatic critique, uh, 
is, well, get rid of all the, the pragmatic stuff is fine. Get rid of all that reliableness stuff. Um, uh, that's uh, Steve Stitch has made that critique of uh, Trout, in my view. Now, my, re my reply uh, to this is, well, either you're interested in offering advice to people, you're interested in being a coach, or you're not. If you're interested in being a coach, then, in my view, mongrel uh, epistemology will give you better advice than the pure pragmatic epistemology or the pure reliableist epistemology. Now, better uh, there uh, needs explanation and argument, uh, which I'm not going to give you because I'm running out of time. Uh, convenient excuse. Uh, and, um, but I'm happy to talk about it uh, afterwards over, over a drink or, uh, or later. Uh, if you're not interested in offering advice, then, um, uh, then what's the relationship between what you're doing and what a good epistemological coach is doing? Uh, so that would be my, my, my question. Um, and that's pretty much all I have. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, what, what are the chances that Sam actually has the disease? Well, the reliableist just says, use the frequency format, and the answer will be 4 out of 23. Okay, so uh, you, you build your little box. You assume there's 100 people in the box. You got five people with the disease. Four of them will test positive. Uh, of the 95 other people, 19 of them will test positive. Bring the 23 people into a room who test positive. Four out of the 23 will have the disease. Okay, well, here's the problem for the, for the pragmatist, and somebody, I don't remember who, you, we were talking about this. Uh, um, so he, here's, here's so, so look, here's the problem for the pragmatist. Uh, what is going to be, for Sam, the pragmatically best thing for him to believe? Something that's accurate, optimistic, or pessimistic? Right, so it, should he believe that his chances are the chances given to you by, uh, by uh, Bayes' theorem? Should he think that the chances that he has the disease are greater than four out of 23? And maybe, because maybe if he does, he'll take, he'll, he'll, he'll take this more seriously uh, and more likely to get, uh, you know, check it out. Or should he be optimistic? Should he be really, you know, think that the chances that he actually has is less because, uh, you know, he'll be able to deal with this psychologically better? The pragmatist can't give you advice, or can't give you useful advice that's simple, right? His, the, the pragmatist's advice is going to be different for different people. And uh, so from a pragmatic perspective, and so, so, so I think that the pragmatist can't actually give useful advice that's general, that's, uh, that's, that says, look, how should, how should somebody reason about these problems? The reliable says, here's how you should reason about the problems. The pragmatist says, I don't know, tell me more about your situation. So I, and I, so I think that from a pragmatic perspective, uh, uh, the reliableist theory is better because it can offer, uh, it can offer uh, advice in that situation. Um, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's the way the argument roughly, roughly runs. So you said a lot of interesting things quite at the beginning, and I thought about those. I might have blocked <laughs> forgotten or didn't even notice what you said afterwards, so sorry if my question was already answered. Um, I re I'm very much into seeing um, rationality theory as, well, depending on, on the purpose, one has to adjust the theory, and I like this coach being account, uh, or advice giving account, and so some, yeah, one can divide epistemologists between those who are interested in giving advisors, guidance, and other ones evaluating, blaming, and those things, I don't like those things, but yeah, evaluating, let's say. And, but usually, you, you mentioned that you are, you think that the accessibility isn't that relevant. The, or, what's, or, the, the uh, what's not relevant? The, Accessibility, that all the relevant factors are actually oh, directly right. accessible for the agent. Right. And usually if you look at the literature, those who are interested in their advice giving they usually are usually internalist and not externalist. And one idea might be that um, it depends on which kind, uh, 
how your advices are meant to be, whether they are going to be general so that the agent can form their stochastic states even when you are not around, for example. They think that the accessibility actually plays a role. So it depends on, I think, on which kind of advices you would like to give. And, and I'm just curious what you think about it. I don't, I don't know how that sort of view is going to work, frankly, because suppose, suppose I'm a Bayesian. I, and I take Bayesian to be an internalist uh, about justification, right? Um, uh, or, or you're uh, an evidentialist. Um, look, if, if you, that is a person who's external to the reasoner, has to go and explain to the reasoner how to be an evidentialist, how to do a better job being an ev evidentialist, it's not clear to me how it is exactly that your advice is an externalist advice. Now it's true that what you're telling the, the person is stuff that, um, that the person will be able to, once they've learned how to reason about a particular kind of problem, they'll be able to do on their own. But that's true for the reliabilist as well, right? The reliabilist says, look, let me teach you how to do a frequency format uh, for dealing with a diagnosis problem. Uh, now that you've learned how to do it, you can go off and you don't need me. You, you've, you've got it in your head and you can do it all on your own. Uh, but in both cases, it seems to me that, that from a coach's perspective, the reasoning, the, 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 the quality of the reason, uh, you have to, let me, let me put it this way, uh, you have to put something into the reasoner's head to get them to reason better. And, and then you would kind of endorse a rule reliabilistic. So as I mentioned before, I might have missed things, but you would be more on that. Oh, I didn't talk very much about, about uh, what kind of advice the reliabilist should give. I have views about that, but I didn't really say anything about that. Anyone else like to raise a question or just make a comment about something earlier? Is it okay? No, I'm sensing fatigue. <laughs> one, one last thing, yeah. This is a bad move to you know, keep things going if you're looking to get to the bar or something. Um, <laughs> Uh, I was wondering, uh, how practical do you think it is to be a coach mm. as a philosophy professor, right? Oh, I mean, excellent, um, yeah. Because you might think one reason for being a judge is just, uh, I mean, there might be objections to mm -hmm. judging, as you're kind of suggesting in passing, but you might think that, um, look, uh, it's not all that, especially if we're talking about um, getting people to shift, not just, I mean, it's tough enough to convince them, we're talking about token beliefs, don't believe that, don't believe this thing about Obama right. or something. But we're actually talking about shifting whole rules of reasoning that they use yeah. to arrive at their beliefs. I guess it partially depends what level we're thinking of these things, mm -hmm. right? If it's something quite uh, high level, like, oh, don't trust this, trust this source of news rather than that, you can get them kind of evidence in a familiar way. But if it's something fundamental, then you might think that uh, it's not all that practical. And moreover, some of the things you're talking about, it seems to me, offhand, I would think that um, uh, whatever skills philosophers have, we're not the best people to be doing this. It's much more, um, if you took the empirical stuff seriously, it would be much more kind of domain specific. Mm -hmm. And you'd want um, competent medical professionals to be giving the best diagnostic, teaching the best diagnostic techniques to people in the profession and different domains, say different things. Thanks. Let's see. Um, uh, it's a great question. Uh, and I actually do have lots of views about this. Um, but. I do sense fatigue, and we want to get to the bar soon. But let me let me give you a little bit a, a little bit of uh, of the background. So, um, so it seems to me that that in thinking about imp improving how people reasoning how people reason, um, uh, philosophers make one kind of mistake, and psychologists make a very different kind of mistake. Uh, the mistake philosophers make is uh, we develop a system, right? That's totally unnatural to how students usually think about the world. And what we do is we teach, uh, it might be based on logic, probability, it might be, uh, might be uh, a system that we've come up with. Um, and uh, what happens is that the good students can do well on the test, uh, they'll learn your system, but when they go out into the real world, they go back to doing what comes naturally. Uh, psychologists have a different, 
different problem in my view. So Kahneman's book, Thinking Fast and Slow, is, is, is a great book uh, despite some, some problems. But, uh, but it's got like 50 chapters in it, right? And, so, and, and they're really interesting, but how do you turn that into useful advice that isn't just sort of all over the place? So I actually, uh, here, here's, here's my basic view. It's a very optimistic view. I, I do have some evidence for it. I've done, I've done some studies uh, on this, but, but here's, here's my, my basic view. Um, for most pragma pragmatically important problems that people face in the world, uh, um, uh, where they make systematic mistakes, there's another problem that's structurally quite similar where they don't make a mistake. Okay, so for example, uh, let me give you a real, uh, real life example. So um, when I teach cr my critical thinking class, I go in and I say, you know, I think some Snickers cause zits because, you know, last night I ate Snickers and today I broke out with zits. Uh, that's really good evidence for thinking Snickers cause zits. And it doesn't take them long. I mean, they don't use the right terminology, but it doesn't take them long to say that's terrible evidence. Two classes later, I'll come in, and we'll talk about why it's terrible evidence, and they'll tell me why it's terrible evidence, and, and, and we'll build it up, and, and they're usually pretty good. A couple classes later, I come in and say, you know, I think that capital punishment prevents violent crime, and then I tell them a story about why that is. And a lot of students, or well, this is the United States, yeah, that sounds right, that sounds good. And I say, but wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Both of these are causal claims. And when it came to Snickers cause zits, your standards were here. When it comes to capital punishment prevents crime, your, your standards are down here. What the heck is going on? So, and I think that this is true in a lot of cases, not just for causal reasoning. So, so the trick, I think, to teaching, uh, to teaching people to reason better is to, to take advantage of their native intelligence. So to, to get them, not, to, not to, to the extent possible, it's not always possible, but to the extent possible to, to get them to recognize that they already have the right rule up there. And it's really a recognition problem. When they reason badly about causal claims, it's not so much that, that they, don't, uh, they don't have the right rule up there. The problem is that they don't recognize that this is the sort of claim that requires them to apply this particular rule. And if you can, and, and that's actually get the, getting them to uh, recognize causal claims. I mean, and look, this is what I do. I start the semester with this, and over the course of the whole semester, I, I, I just throw in causal claims at various arbitrary places. And by the end of the semester, they're pretty good at saying, all right, if that's a causal claim, you're going to need a control, yada, yada, yada. They're really, they're, 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 they're pretty good at it. Uh, what's that? Well, let me tell you. I did a, I did a study um, uh, where I did a pretest, post test, and delayed post test. Um, and uh, well, I've done two studies. Uh, the first one was with Peter Vranas, um, uh, and uh, we got really interesting results. Uh, the second study I just finished, uh, and I don't have results totally analyzed yet, but. Um, uh, the problem with the study is that, is that the delayed post-test, you don't get a lot of responses. You don't really get enough responses. But basically, a pre-test, post-test in, in, in my class and various control classes. And with Peter, what we found, what we found is that, um, is that with the delayed post-test, post-test, not surprisingly, a huge difference. Because right? it's in the class, et cetera, et cetera. They, they just finished, they're, they're about to take the final. Delayed post-test, there was, no statistical, there was no statistically significant difference between the two groups, but if you carved out the uh, A and B plus students in the experimental group and the control group, there was a significant difference. Um, uh, but Peter, Peter uh, did not have tenure at the time and did not want to publish this because he thought, and if for, the, for, you, for those of you who are philosophers, you will uh, appreciate this, he thought that um, that uh, publishing a paper on pedagogy would destroy his career. Uh, yeah, so, so I do have some evidence that, that suggests that, that maybe this does stick better than, uh, than you know, teaching them baby logic and 